can we give Jesus some praise today? Across every campus with all that we have, let's give Jesus some praise in this moment. Come on, just a few more moments. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our affection. We thank you, Lord. Come on, just take a moment. Take a moment. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place across every campus right now. Begin to just ask the Lord. If you need a touch in your life, begin to just ask the Lord to fill the room. God, we thank you that your presence is here today. We thank you for who you are. Jesus, people don't need a word from me. They need a word from you today. We are desperate. We are hungry for more of you. We thank you, God, for what you're going to do today. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Come on, can we just create an atmosphere of worship today? To worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice. Come on, we sing. Take joy, my King. In what you hear, let this be our prayer today. That what we say, oh, let it be a sweet, sweet sound. God, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. We invite you today, Holy. Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Can we give God some praise in this place? We love you, Jesus. You can be seated. Thank you, team. Good job with flown for that. That was not prepared. That was the Holy Spirit there. I was a little worried that our team wouldn't know what to do with that, and they did a great job. That's awesome. Hey, um, I, I want to give a quick little update. Um, this is the first time that I've ever preached a sermon um, as a father, as a dad, which is a really cool thing. Um, <laughs> for those that um, don't know, um, my uh, the last time I preached, um, I was preaching a sermon last year called Don't Worry, Be Happy. And we were talking about uh, how to overcome anxiety, how to overcome worry. And I was in a season of major anxiety, major worry, uh, because I desperately, my wife and I desperately wanted a baby. We, we were praying for it. We were believing for it. The Lord had given us a word at the beginning of 2020 that this was going to be our year. He gave us the word um, of Matthew 6, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and everything else will be added unto us. And, um, and this year on April 20th, uh, we, the Lord added to us a beautiful baby boy. His name is Judah David Benedictus Steele. And... Um, and he is just absolutely amazing. And I just want to take a moment. The Lord kind of dropped this into my heart today. Um, the Bible says that we will be overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And this is my testimony. This is my miracle baby. And I just even wanted to encourage somebody today who's maybe in a season of infertility, who's in a season of praying and believing for God to move. You have a dream on your heart. For this season and can I just encourage somebody under the sound of my voice that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly all that we can think or imagine I don't care what the doctor says we serve a God that's bigger than a doctor's report and God is faithful and good his promises are yes and amen um, I want to give honor to uh, Pastor Aaron um, as well uh, Pastor Aaron is just I don't think we could have or ask for a better pastor and leader and man of God to follow. And uh, thank you, Pastor Aaron and Katie, for the sacrifice, the heart that it takes to lead and operate this church. Um, and uh, God is just uh, so good to have blessed us with you and Katie. So can we honor our, our lead pastor? I've been praying, um, I've been praying for quite some time um, for the Lord to give me a word, and man, did he give me a word today. Um, it's a challenging word. It's something that the Lord's been genuinely challenging me. I hope it challenges you today, 
And I really believe that it's a word that our church, as we prepare, as Pastor Aaron was saying in that video, for a harvest season to come, I believe that this is a word to prepare for that harvest that's to come. And so we're going to look at Exodus 33. If you have your Bibles there, you can turn with me, Exodus 33. We're going to look at the life of Moses. And so for those that aren't familiar with the story of Moses, Moses was really called out of the people of Israel to save the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. For those that don't know the people of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament find themselves in a season of bondage, in a season of slavery, and God calls Moses to come back and to set his people free. Really, you could say all of Moses' life was geared to this one moment, this one destiny this one opportunity to be used by God. And so God uses Moses to deliver them out of Egypt and he's leading them to the promised land. And they've been wandering through a desert season. How many of you have maybe been in a little bit of a desert season throughout 2020 and maybe the beginning of this year and you've been wandering and you've been wondering how long is this season gonna last? Well, that's what the people of Israel have found themselves in. They've been grumbling, they've been frustrated, they've been acting fools, uh, building calves and altars and worshiping false gods. And, and they've been doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And Moses, their leader, finds himself in a moment with God where God's going, all right, I'm about to bring you out of this desert season and into the promised land, the place that I called you to lead my people to. And we see in Exodus 33, verse 12, Moses says to the Lord, you've been telling me to lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. How many of you want God to know you by name? How many of you want God to have favor with you, that we will have favor with God? If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. These aren't my people, God. These are your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth, if not your presence? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you. I do know you by name. And then Moses said, now show me your glory. The title of my sermon today is First Things First. Let's pray one more time. God, I thank you so much that you're here. Holy Spirit, would you allow me to step out of the way? God, would you speak through me today? Everything that's David, would it fall to the ground? Everything that's you, would it touch every heart and every mind? Would your word transform us today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. How many of you have ever been in love before? Can we see a show of hands? How many of you have ever been in love? All the husbands in the room better raise your hands real quick. <laughs> real quick. I, mean, I don't think I ever really knew what love was until I met my wife, Alicia Steele. To be honest, if I'm gonna be 100% honest, I thought I knew what love was, but I really didn't know what love was until I met my wife, my amazing wife. For those that don't know, uh, our story's a little funny. So her dad actually is this world famous uh, evangelist. He's traveled the world. He's done a lot of amazing things. His name is Pastor Benny Hinn. For those that aren't familiar with him, that's my father-in-law. I've never really talked about it too much. And, and he's an amazing man of God. And he came and preached actually at my home church in, uh, in Pensacola, Florida, where Pastor Aaron was our youth pastor. And I was in this internship and her dad goes, I want my daughter to come be a part of this thing. Well, naturally, all the young men in the youth group or in the internship are going to be like, who is Benny Hinn's daughter? i got to find out who that girl is. And so I look up this video in this sermon of her uh, leading worship and preaching. And you ever have this moment where you're just like, destiny hits you in the face, and you're just like, Lord, that is my wife. I name it and claim it. I don't even believe in the prosperity gospel, but I sowed extra tithes that Sunday. I'm just like, <laughs> God, I'm believing in Jesus' name. <laughs> And it didn't happen, it didn't happen, it didn't work out, and so two years goes by, and I end up moving into uh, Bible College, Lakeland, Florida, in 2013, I came down to help plant the church, and on move-in day, there goes this girl that I prayed for two years before, and turns out we were actually neighbors. 
And I was like, Lord, you are faithful to your word. You are, bless you, Jesus, hallelujah. And so every single day for a little bit, I would kind of stalk her and I would kind of walk past her awkwardly and, and wave to her and act like I knew who she was, but she definitely had no idea who I was. And so uh, we ended up starting to date, thank you, Jesus. And we were doing pretty well. Um, we were dating, we were starting to get pretty serious. We were ready to get married. And um, how many of you know you can be dating but, and getting ready to marry, but until that father-in-law um, approves of you, you ain't going nowhere. There ain't nothing going to happen. And so I was like, well, I'm pretty good. This is no big deal. I think he's going to like me. Well, it came to the moment where uh, I had to uh, meet Pastor Benny Hinn. And for those that don't know my father-in-law, uh, he's a bit of a traditional guy. He's an incredible man of God. God's used him mightily throughout the world. Um, but he's a bit traditional. He's Middle Eastern. Um, he's a bit serious at times, and I was scared to death, if I could be 100% honest with you. I was so scared, and so it comes to the point where I, I meet him, and I'm trying to gain his blessing. I'm trying to gain his, uh, I'm trying to gain his, his, his blessing to marry his baby girl, his youngest daughter. Here I am, this young punk kid with skinny jeans and tattoos <laughs> coming in to meet this guy's uh, this guy and marry his daughter. So... Uh, it, it does not go well at all, if I were to be 100% honest with you. Um, I, he, he liked me, but he wasn't sure if, if I was her husband. I remember it came to a point where he had a conversation with Alicia, and the conver I wasn't there, but I know him, and the conversation was a little bit like this. Baby, I do not know if that man is your husband or not. I need to see that he is first a man of God. And I need to first see if he's a man that can lead his family. Until then, you do not have my blessing. Bubba, if you're listening, that's my impersonation of you. Um, and I remember I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to, you know what? I'm just going to step out in faith, and I'm just going to spend Christmas with him, and I'm going to gain the blessing that way. Um, I don't recommend that. That makes for a really awkward and uncomfortable. I just kind of moved into the house. I just moved into the, into the place. And so I remember it's Christmas Eve. I've left my family. I'm literally there only with them. And it's me, her, and her dad in the living room. And her dad goes, babe, we're going to go out to dinner as a family. And David is going to stay here and wait. And then he can join us afterwards. First off, I was hungry. <laughs> As you can tell, your boy can eat. And I'm like, I've, I'm literally going to spend Christmas by myself. Oh, Lord, whatever it takes to marry this girl, Lord, please do it. And uh, it comes to a point where her and her dad are just arguing back and forth. Have you ever been in that moment where people are arguing in front of you and you literally do not know what to do? And you're just awkwardly standing there and they're arguing back and forth. And Alicia's like, I'm not going unless David goes. And he's like, you are going to go. I'm not going unless David goes. And they're back and forth, back and forth. And it finally comes to a point where I literally go, this is my moment. This is my shot. And I go, Alicia, you are going to go with your family. I am going to stay here. You're going to have a great Christmas, and it's all going to be fine. Now, I didn't hear the voice of God that spoke to my father-in-law at that moment. <laughs> but I honestly have a feeling the Lord was just like, Benny, this is your son-in-law. <laughs> he is a man, though he wears skinny jeans. <laughs> and from that moment, I had the blessing. I was in good graces. And, and, and uh, no, I couldn't see out of my left eye after Alicia got done with me for about a week, but... It was okay. And my wife did something so amazing in that moment. If David doesn't go, she loved me enough. If David doesn't go, I don't want to go without him. And we see that in the life of Moses here. Moses' whole life has led up to this moment. Moses' whole life, the reason he was saved as a baby and put in the basket and the reason he was raised in Pharaoh's home and, and the reason he was sent out into the wilderness to have the encounter with the burning bush and then the reason he was sent back to Egypt and then to pull the people out of Egypt and into the promised land, the whole reason Moses existed was for this moment to be used by God. And we see Moses here go, great. God, you're about to fulfill my destiny. You're about to fulfill my purpose. But if you don't go with me, I don't want to go. And I wonder today if that if we were put into Moses' shoes, would we have the same response? Have we gotten to a place 
where we love God enough to go, God, I don't care about the house. I don't care about the cars. I don't care about the dreams. I don't care about the call. I don't care about the destiny on my life. I just want you. You see, our number one thing as Christians and believers of Jesus and followers of Jesus is simply to love God with everything. We see this in Mark chapter 12. So this is going to be kind of our anchor verse Here today. So, this is Jesus talking. So, if you want to turn with me in Mark chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 29. And we see this. Jesus is doing some teaching and he's talking to some some people, and a a Pharisee is there and he asked the question. You see, in the Old Testament, there was hundreds of laws, hundreds of laws that the religious laws that they would have to abide by. And, and, And the Pharisee asked Jesus, What is the most important? Well, if you had, out of all the laws, what is the most important? And Jesus answers him and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. The second is this, to love your, enemy, or love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You can write it in your notes this way. I believe our greatest command as Christians today is complete and total love and devotion to Jesus. That's the greatest thing that we're called to do. And I, and I wonder today, and I pose the question, how are you doing at loving God? Honestly, it's sometimes uncomfortable to use that language, right? Like in culture today, it's like, well, well what is love? Love is, we, we, we say, oh, we talk about love all the time. Like love, we have love in romantic movies. We have, we, I love pizza. I love ice cream. Like there's a lot of different things that I love. I don't love CrossFit. Like there's just a lot of different things that we would say that we love and we don't love. And I don't love this now, but I do love that. So what is this love? Well, the word that, that Jesus actually used here for the love in the Greek is actually agape which actually means this, this, this self-sacrificing love, this unconditional love, this love that costs us something, that doesn't have any kind of, of, of agenda, this love that's pure, this love that's holy, this love that's just reckless abandon for. And I wonder today, do you love God that way? Do you love God with that kind of love? I actually asked some of our team today, this week, actually, as I was preparing for this sermon, I was going to title this sermon, uh, How to Fall in Love with Jesus. And it's so funny, some of the team asked, like, are you even, can, does that make sense? Like, can you say fall in love with Jesus? I, I think, and, and this is no shade on them, but I just think, I think we sometimes can forget that our number one call is actually to love Jesus. To love Jesus with everything, to love Jesus unconditionally, not what he can do for us, not the house that he can bring, not the plans that he can bring. Honestly, sometimes I think we can do it with, uh, with decent motives, like we come to God because we want our lives changed. We come to God because we want freedom. We come to God because we want breakthrough. We come to God because we want, you know, that healing and that we, we recognize. But, and those things are, are not bad. But if they're not rooted first in just, I love you because you first loved me. I loved you because you're the only thing in this world worthy of genuine, true love. I love you first, and then I love my kids and my family. I love you with everything that I have. That's what we're called to do. And actually, I think, and you can write it in your notes this way, I think the greatest attack of the enemy today on your life will be to to forsake the greatest commandment which is to love God with everything. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then love your neighbors as yourselves. And actually, church, can I, can I encourage you? I think we've actually gotten really good at loving our neighbors as ourselves. Can I, can I encourage you? Like, you're a part of a church that's making a difference in a community. Isn't this so awesome? Like, what we did at Serve Day, 700 plus Dream Teamers, a hundred of th- over 100,000 bags packed and given to the, to the poor and to the needy of our community. Like, God is doing something amazing here. And for, the, for a long time, the Capital C Church was known for a lot of things, but it wasn't known for loving the neighbors. 
It was known for being judgmental. It was known. I think we've gotten really good at loving our neighbors. My fear is, though, is that we've got our priorities mixed up, and actually we're doing better at loving our neighbors as ourselves than we are at actually loving Jesus. Uh, is, is it easier for you to love your neighbor than it is for you to pray? Is it easier for you to come to a serve day or to join a group or, or, or to serve on the dream team than it is to spend time with God? And, and, and you see, church, I think we've got to get back to this place where, God, you are the first priority in my life. I don't care what happens to me. I love you more than I love anything else. Because truthfully, that's what the world needs. The world needs Christians, the body of Christ, to stand up and boldly declare the love of Jesus. And then that helps us actually love them more because we actually have the proper love of Jesus in our lives first. So Amen? So how do we do this? How do we, how do we love God? Jesus kind of plainly puts this out for us, so let's look at his model. So love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. How, how do we love God with all of our heart? Our first thing is we've got to learn how to love God with all of our heart. How do we, how do, we do this? You see, the Greek word that was used for heart here is the word cardia, meaning the center of where everything flows. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it, Proverbs 4.23 says. Did you know that the leading death cause in America is actually heart disease? Did you know that? And did you know the reason why heart disease is so bad is because of simply just unhealthy habits, unhealthy living, unhealthy habits. I did a lot of research on this, and I learned that if I'm not careful, I might be in very close uh, proximity to some heart disease because I've not been eating and living the best. Um, that I, I'm not Pastor Aaron. I'm doing the CrossFit stuff. So I'm working through this. I got really challenged. This sermon really came close to home. And, um, and, and so I learned, like, the habits that we do, what we feed our heart, what we feed our body actually controls how our, the rest of our body functions. Could I make the case today that maybe the leading cause of spiritual heart disease is actually the things that we're adding into our lives? Yeah. Yeah. Could I make the case that what, what are you filling your heart with on a, on, on a consistent basis? What have you allowed into your life? What unhealthy habits, what unhealthy living have you allowed in? Is it culture? Have we gotten to a place with what we're listening to and what we're watching and, and what we're saying and what we're taking in? Has it affected our hearts to where now where our hearts no longer burn for Jesus? And now we're wondering why our marriage is where it's at. We're wondering why our kids are acting the way that they act. We're wondering why we're not, we're not living out the dream and the call that's in our life. What are you feeling with your heart? And you think, you know, I think one of the greatest antidotes to this, and you can put this in your notes is simply just fasting. How do we get our heart back into the right place? We gotta start fasting. What does fasting do? Fasting simply just disconnects us from the world. It disconnects us from those unhealthy things. Have you ever noticed whenever you start a diet and it seems like every demon from hell comes into your path to try to get you off of that diet? I'm a master of starting diets. I'm pretty terrible at finishing them if I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. Uh, and, and it seems like every time I start a diet, it's like that coworker brings in Dunkin' Donuts for that, that randomly. They've never done that ever before until the day I start a diet and they bring in Dunkin' Donuts in the office. I'm just like, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> as I'm stuffing my face with donuts. And it, it's just like, it's one of those things where it's like, man, I, I don't understand. You see, what fasting actually does is fasting actually reveals what controls your heart. I dare you to try taking your phone for a day, turning it off, deleting social media, and see what happens. I tried this this week. The craziest thing happened. My legs started to twitch like my phone was vibrating. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Where you're like, my phone's not even on me. And it's like, I'm like got a, I've got an itch. It's like I've got, a, I've got a problem that there's something. 
These things, these outward things are controlling our hearts and we wonder why our heart isn't for God. It's because we've allowed a lot of unhealthy habits and it's actually causing spiritual heart disease. Let's get our hearts back for God. Let's start fasting and can get all the junk out of our life and get our hearts back for Jesus and fall more in love with him. Amen? The second thing is how do we love God? We love God with all of our soul. With all of our soul. Soul in the Greek here means suitcase. Not suitcase. Suitcase. Meaning breath. The seat of all the feelings and desires and affections. How's your soul today? How's your soul? This is something that every time I go on a date night with my wife, um, she's, she's so awesome. We go on a date and we're talking, and I'm like, I'm like a side by side person, so we'll like go out and do stuff. And she's like a face to face. She just wants to sit and look at me. And she, she just asks, like, How's your soul today? I'm just like, I, th- I think okay. How do we know? How is our soul doing? Well, this, I love that it uses this word breath. You know what I've realized with our soul sometimes is actually in this, in this culture and in this climate today, it, it, it seems like, have you ever had like a panic attack where you get shortness of breath and where you start feeling like unrest and you start feeling uneasy and you start feeling uncomfortable? Are you feeling that in this season at all? That would, I'd make the case that maybe your soul needs to find rest in God. Look what, the, look what Psalm says. Psalm 62, one says, truly my soul finds what? Rest. In God, my salvation comes from him. Look what Matthew 11, this is Jesus talking. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. We've got to find rest for our souls. Are you, are you anxious? Are, do you feel all over the place? Or is your soul just longing to be with Jesus? Longing to have intimacy with him? Longing to have relationship with him? You see, I believe the antidote for our souls is actually, and you can put in your notes this way, it's simply just prayer, time with God. And I'm not talking about just like, good God, let's eat, you know, that kind of prayer. I'm talking about like, actually, like, when's the last time you've spent time with the Lord? When's the last time you just sat in his presence and said, Holy Spirit, talk with me. I want to spend time with you. I want you. If you don't know how to do this, we actually have something amazing coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's, it's 21 days of prayer. This is an awesome opportunity for you. It starts on August 1st to get plugged in, to learn how to pray, to learn how to spend time with God. Your soul needs it. Fasting, you can write this in your notes. Fasting disconnects us from the world. Here's what prayer does. Prayer simply connects us with God. You've got to fast, get rid of the junk of the world, Pray, connect with God, to love God with our heart, to love God with our soul. The third thing is, how do we love God? We have to love God with all of our mind. We have to love God with all of our mind. Mind in the Greek here is dianoia. It means intellect, understanding, reason. Dianoia. I was so worried today that I was going to say diarrhea, to be 100% honest with you. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Just your mind needs this explosion of just, I'm just, that, it's, that'd be weird. <laughs> have you noticed that in this season, it seems like so many Christians have just lost their mind? We've allowed fear to creep in. We've allowed inconsistencies in politics and all this crazy cultural climate that we find ourselves in. And apparently aliens are coming down and all this random stuff. And we've just, we've legit lost our mind. There's been so many people that have posted on social and I'm just like, I thought you were a man of God. I thought you followed Jesus. Your reasoning is off. And it's because we're not, and you can put this as in your notes as the antidote, we're not spending time in God's word. Have you forsaken the daily time in God's word, reading the Bible? Do you find that you, you find yourself like, man, this thing angers me more than it used to. I feel like I'm doubting more than I used to. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm not as sure anymore. You've got to get the word of God in you. You've got to get some, some, some opportunities to start, to start praying and reading the Bible and applying those scriptures into your life. I love what Psalms 1, 1 through 2 says. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners or takes it in the company of mockers but whose delight is in what? The law of the Lord, his word, and who meditates on it when? Day and night. 
These sound very fundamental things, but I think, honestly, as believers, we've, we've kind of gotten too comfortable. We've gotten too comfortable. We've gotten too comfortable just praying and with fasting and reading God. And, and now, because of that, I think we're starting to lose, we're starting to lose our way. I love this quote by Charles Spurgeon. It says, when asked, what is more important, prayer or reading the Bible? I ask, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? We need this in our lives, man. We've got to get back to a place of daily, consistent time in his word and spending time in his presence. The last thing is we've got to love God with all of our strength. We've got to love God with all of our strength. Strength in the Greek here is iskus. It means with all of our power, with all of our might, all of our strength. Can I be honest? I've been so concerned with the amount of Christians that have just simply walked away from the faith in this season. Christians who are on fire for Jesus and throughout this last year have just simply walked away from the faith. What's even been crazier is to see the Christians that used to be so bold, used to stand up for what's right, they just seem so weak, so timid. I ask you today, would you, find, would you say that your relationship with God would be defined as powerful? Do you have strength? Whenever you, whenever you talk to that coworker, do you feel nervous and, unash- and, and ashamed and awkward or do, timid or do, or do you have boldness? And the antidote for this is simply just the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit into our lives, into our relationship with God. I, I love this verse in 2 Timothy 1, 6. It says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into fame, flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us what? Power, love, and self-discipline. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. You need the Holy Spirit to make this thing happen. You need the Holy Spirit in your life to give you power, to continually refueling that love that we have and we need for Jesus. When's the last time that you invited the Holy Spirit just simply to come into your life, to yield to him? We've got to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. I remember uh, being newly married in our first year of marriage. Uh, we learned date nights from Pastor Aaron and Katie. And uh, so we kind of, we, we, we really have tried hard to keep those very consistent. And uh, we put a lot of pressure on our date nights, to be honest. I put a lot of pressure on date nights, to be honest. And um, for those that are familiar with the five love languages, my love language is acts of service. Do I have any other acts of service people in the room? Okay, there's a few. So I remember one day she went out with her friends we had date night that night, and I'm literally in the house, um, and I get the house absolutely spotlessly clean. I mean, I cleaned out the refrigerator. I cleaned out the cabinets. I went and got her car washed. I did all of these things for her, and so she comes back with her friends, and we're, she's getting ready for date night, and here's what my wife does. My wife just simply walks in and goes, hey, babe, walks right past the house, <laughs> right past the refrigerator, right up to the room, starts getting dressed. And I'm sitting there going, you must have lost your mind. Are you kidding me? I worked it. So we get dressed, we go to that, we go to date, and I'm just sitting there. And she's like, are you okay? You seem on edge. I just, I finally just kind of like, what do you mean? Yeah, of course I'm on edge. I worked all day for you. I did all of these things for you. I, do you not see the house? Do you not see the car? Do you not see all the stuff? And my wife is just the most gracious, loving, wonderful woman of God. Honestly, she's a gift from the Lord. Because she simply just looks at me. She goes, babe. I didn't ask you for any of those things. You didn't have to do all that stuff for me. All all I wanted is just you. I just wanted time with you. I wanted communion with you. And church, I, I think we've gotten to a place where we're doing all the things. We're doing the groups, we're doing the serve days, we're doing, we're doing church, we're we're trying to do all the stuff. 
And God goes, listen, all of that's great and that's awesome, but I just want you. I want your heart. I want your love. I want your affection. I never want to get to heaven and, and, and stand before Jesus and go, God, I planted churches in your name. I, I baptized people in your name. I served behind a camera. I served on the dream team. I served in kids. And he goes, depart from me because I never knew you. We're, we're called to be in relationship with Jesus. How are you doing at loving him? So many people have walked away in this season because they've started to love people more than they love God. Or they've used God to get the dream. And, say, and now I, I believe God's calling us to a season and to a time where we say, God, I don't care about the promise. All I want is your presence. I don't care about the dream. All I want is you. You're the number one thing in my heart and in my life that I desire. So can we have a moment today where we stand to our feet across every campus and we make that declaration today, just simply saying, God, I just want you. Lord, would you rekindle the fire again in my life? Lord, would you restir again the move in my heart? God, forgive me for not loving you. Forgive me for putting other things above you. God, all I want is you. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. We say. for two people in the room today. So I could get every head bowed, every eye closed across all of our campuses today. We welcome you here, Holy Spirit. Lord, would you challenge us in this moment? I want to pray for first a group of people that you would say that you are a believer. You've been following Jesus. But if you were to be 100% honest and transparent today, you've lost your love. You've lost that first love. You've lost that first thing. I love what 1 Corinthians 2 says. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things of God that he has prepared for those who love him. You'd say, David, you know what? I've lost my love for Jesus, and I want to get it back today. All you have to do is simply invite the Holy Spirit back into your life. Make a commitment today. God, I love you. I want to come back to loving you more. If that's you, on the count of three, will you raise your hand so I can pray with you? Nobody's looking around. On the count of three, one, two, three. Wow. Wow, so many hands across every campus. So many hands. That's amazing. That's amazing. Simply just pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, I want to love you. I want to love you with everything. Forgive me, Lord, for losing my first love. Forgive me, Lord, for loving people more than loving you. I return to you today. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart. Help me to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. The second group of people, and every head is still bowed, every eye is still closed. It's for those who are in the room today and you'd say, David, I've actually never experienced this love for myself. I've actually never accepted Jesus into my heart and into my life. And I'd like to make that decision today. I want to experience this love. I want to experience this God. And if that's you today and you want to make that decision to follow Jesus and accept him into your heart, it's the best decision you'll ever make. If that's you today, on the count of three, I want you to simply just raise your hand. And I want to pray with you. You can experience that love of God today. One, two, three. If that's you, just simply raise your hand. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hands all over the place. Thank you, Lord. If that's you, can we have everybody pray this together? Just everybody pray together. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. I give you my everything. 
I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus, you are Lord. Transform my life today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you believe that and you prayed that today, welcome to the family of God. You just made the best decision of your life. Come on, let's give it up for those who made that decision today.